Hello. So you want to know about the anatomy of the inguinal hernia? I can do that. Uh, we have looked at the anatomy of the abdominal walls before, um, but this will be talking about the inguinal hernia specifically. We will talk about the anatomy of the inguinal canal, the brief version. We will talk about uh, the direct and indirect inguinal hernia little comparison to the femoral hernia, um, but that'll be our focus, all right? This will be anatomical information, not medical advice, because I am an anatomist, a scientist that studies anatomy and teaches anatomy. Um, this is some pretty cool anatomy. So my friend here doesn't have any testes, nor a scrotum. Well, it's just bone and cartilage, aren't you? But um, that's the crux of the matter here. So in here, we have organs, viscera, and while we have the rib cage here, much of the body wall is made up of layers of muscle. Muscle is a good building block, but it also lets us move our trunk. It supports the back, that sort of thing, right? So we've got layers of muscle here forming the body wall, but the testes are on the outside. That's because spermatogenesis, the process of making new spermatozoa, seems to be most effective, optimal, at a couple of degrees below body temperature, so about 35 degrees rather than 37 degrees. So they're outside the body, but nearby. But those testes, not only must there be a tube so that the spermatozoa can pass from the testes to the penis, but there must also be blood vessels and lymphatic vessels and nerves running to the testes, which means that there must be a way of getting those structures from inside the abdomen and the pelvis outside through that muscular body wall to the testes, right? And that's the issue. All right, here we go. Here are those layers. So now we, see, we can see the muscular wall. This muscle is rectus abdominis in the, the midline here, the six pack, not interested in that one today. Um, if we spin around that away, this muscle here, is the external oblique muscle. The fibers are running in that direction. Um, if we take away external oblique, we find this muscle, the internal oblique muscle. These fibers are running in the opposite direction. So we have two layers of fibers running over one another. And then underneath internal oblique, we find another muscle layer. And these fibers are running transversely around the abdomen. This is transversus abdominis. So we have three layers of muscles making the muscle wall of the abdomen, which is a great way of making a muscle wall. You've got all these fibers running in different directions, allows for movement, keeps everything in, can raise intra-abdominal pressure if needed during coughing, sneezing, that sort of thing. Um, so what's the problem then? Well, down here, you can see that opening that allows structures to pass to the testis. Right? And as I said, there are a number of structures that go through there. So there's a weakness. There's a weakness in this abdominal wall. And the abdominal wall isn't entirely muscle. There is another layer, as we see in most places around the body, um, fascia. So fascia is a connective tissue sheet. It's made of collagen, it's got a fibroblast to look after it, it's super tough, it's wrapped around the body in all sorts of places, it's responsible for much of our shape and holding us together. And lining these muscles here is the transversalis fascia, and then the next layer is the peritoneum, which is the serous membrane that is the membrane covering all of the, all of the abdominal stuff. Peritoneum, that's a whole other kettle of fish. But the transversalis fascia is going to be important. And now look, we're looking at the inside of the abdominal wall muscles and we can see an opening here and here. And we can see a tube, a canal. That there is the inguinal canal. So we've talked about the three layers of muscles and the transversalis fascia. I'm going to give you a couple more words and then we can do the inguinal canal. Um, the white that we're seeing here is these flat muscles, muscles become tendons that attach to bone, right? In this case, the flat muscles become flat tendons. A flat tendon is an aponeurosis. And where the aponeurosis of the internal oblique muscle and transversus abdominis muscles come together, here, medially, they form the conjoint tendon. Right, inguinal canal time, the short version. Here's the external oblique muscle. 
Um, the external oblique muscle ends down here as the inguinal ligament. There's an inguinal ligament running from the bone here to the bone here. This is the, the pubis bone down there. So you can think of the external oblique muscle as kind of ending kind of like by curving around, kind of like that, right? So the external oblique ends at the inguinal ligament. The inguinal ligament then is the boundary between the abdominal wall and the lower limb, right? Here is the inguinal canal opening here. So the inguinal canal is a tube, a canal, passing through those muscles and the transversalis fascia that I talked about. So the structures that need to run to the testis can run between the testis and abdominopelvic structures. Um, if the external oblique muscle is ending at the inguinal ligament and doing that curly roundy thing, then the external oblique muscle is forming most of the anterior wall of that inguinal canal. The internal oblique does a little bit of it. The transversalis fascia and the conjoint tendon form the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. The inguinal ligament is down here, so the inguinal ligament forms the floor of the inguinal canal, and these deeper muscles, transversus abdominis and internal oblique, form the roof of the inguinal canal. Which parts of the inguinal canal do you think are going to be weakest? So there's an opening here, uh, which is inside the abdomen. That would be the deep inguinal ring or the internal inguinal ring. There is an opening externally or superficially. That would be the superficial inguinal ring or the external inguinal ring. Those are good candidates for weak points, but that transversalis fascia is not as strong as a muscle. Muscles are strong. In fact, this is um, such a nice structure that when you raise your intra-abdominal pressure, <coughs> what you're doing there is you're contracting these muscles. So if you have an inguinal canal made up of these muscles with things going through it, and you contract the abdominal walls to raise your intra-abdominal pressure, those muscles actually squeeze the inguinal canal more tightly, so they make a good firm seal most of the time to keep the abdominal contents where they're supposed to be in the abdomen. What is a hernia? Well, um, if, if we take the example of the inguinal hernia, we have viscera, we have organs, and other things like fat inside the abdominal cavity, and they're supposed to stay inside the abdominal cavity. If they leave the abdominal cavity and move somewhere they're not supposed to be, that's a hernia. It's, it could be just fat, but it's likely to be small bowel because small bowel has got a mesentery, it can move around fairly freely, and it's, it's down here. So we've identified a weakness here. Um, an inguinal hernia then will be a bulge um, superior to the inguinal ligament at the location of the inguinal canal. So, for example, a loop of small intestine has moved into the inguinal canal, and it can do this in two ways. It could go into that deep inguinal ring and pass along the inguinal canal, and then we have a bulge here. Or that transversalis fascia may stretch, may, may allow the small bowel to move directly into the inguinal canal, and that will give a bulge in roughly the same place. So an inguinal hernia will be a bulge that appears superior to the inguinal ligament. Uh, the pubic tubercle is a, a bony prominence on the pubis here. The inguinal hernia will be superior and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Whereas if you have a mass down here, inferior to the inguinal ligament, inferior to the pubic tubercle, that's going to be a femoral hernia. That will be maybe a small loop of bowel again, but that would have taken a different route to get down here. Now you know the anatomy of the inguinal canal and how that small bowel might be moving into it in kind of this direction, that hernia, that small bowel or whatever it is, could continue along the inguinal canal towards the scrotum and the testes. Um, the hernia might be reducible. You might be able to encourage it with pressure from fingers to go back up the inguinal canal and back into the abdominal cavity. In fact, if the person with an inguinal hernia has a mass 
Well, if they go from a sitting position to a lying supine position, that might be enough to reduce the hernia, pull it back into the abdominal cavity. If somebody stands up, the, 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 the lump, the, the, the bulge might become more prominent again. Um, with raising intra-abdominal pressure, coughing would also accentuate the bulge, that sort of thing, right? So remember that anatomy in terms of that's the direction the hernia is moving in. To reduce it, it needs to go that way. Uh, and note, if the, uh, if the bulge is tender, that's not a good sign. That might need urgent attention. Okay, what's the difference between a direct and an indirect inguinal hernia then? Um, a direct inguinal hernia, so there's the, um, the deep inguinal ring there. Um, a direct inguinal hernia, there's a weakening in the transversalis fascia and the small bowel loop will push through that transversalis fascia directly into the inguinal canal. That bulge will be medial to the inferior epigastric vessels if you're interested in that sort of thing. This one is actually not likely to pass along the inguinal canal to the scrotum because it's kind of, it's, you know, it, it push, it's not, it's not being allowed to flow through the inguinal canal, right? If a direct inguinal hernia is left for a long period of time and becomes particularly large and uh, all this becomes particularly weak, then yeah, it can progress into the scrotum, but it's not really likely to. An indirect inguinal hernia is when there is a weakness in that deep inguinal ring. That ing deep inguinal ring is supposed to be, you know, a good structure that keeps everything where it's supposed to be. If there's a weakness there, such as a you know, congenital weakness that hasn't formed quite properly, then the small bowel might go through the deep inguinal ring and then passes along the inguinal canal. And this one is a little bit more likely to pass out through the superficial inguinal ring and continue on towards the scrotum, given enough time. Uh, both are superior to the inguinal ligament. An indirect inguinal hernia is a little bit more lateral. A direct inguinal hernia is a little bit more medial. But they're both bulges at the location of the inguinal canal. What else do you need to know? Um, inguinal hernias are more common on the right than the left. Inguinal hernias are more common in men than women. Men have a larger inguinal canal because more structures pass through it to get to the scrotum and the testes. Um, the female abdominal wall also has an inguinal canal, but it's smaller. So there is also a risk of inguinal hernia in women. Um, inguinal hernia is more common in older people. So the direct inguinal hernia is more common in older people because connective tissue is not as strong when we're older than when we were younger. It's not as good at maintaining itself. So that transversalis fascia is more likely to be weaker when we are older, leading to a direct inguinal hernia. The indirect inguinal hernia is more common in younger people because that, that deep inguinal ring hasn't quite formed as it should. So there's a weakness there and the small bowel can then pass in that away. We are talking about connective tissues here. So anybody with a collagen disorder is more likely to have an inguinal hernia, right? Um, a, uh, a weakness in the abdominal wall is likely to need surgery to repair it. And what you need to worry about is um, obstruction of the bowel and strangulation of the bowel. If either of those things are suspected, that will need urgent repair. But there you go. That's, that's the anatomy of the inguinal hernia. I hope I covered it effectively and briefly. There are longer videos on all of this somewhere. Anyway, thank you very much. See you next week.